Thank you. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jason Cranford Teague, and I'd like to start off today uh, by reading you a little story about maps. In the empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the empire, the entirety of the province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the cartographer's guilds struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that that vast map was useless. And not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the West, still today, there are tattered ruins of the map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. That was written by uh, George Louis Borgia. Um, and I, th I think it really informs a lot of what we do in our profession. We are UX designers, and what we are doing is we are mapping out the user experience. And oftentimes, we want to make such complex and complicated maps of what we're doing that we lose sight of the true objective of your user experience. Um, so, you can join along. Uh, actually, I, I, I'm at JasonCT on Twitter, and uh, I came up with my own uh, hashtag, if you want to use that, so I can see what's going on. Temporal uh, UX in Z. Um, so before we dive into temporal design thinking, we, we should think a little bit about what exactly design thinking is. At its simplest, design thinking is thinking like a designer. Yeah, not particularly complex, also not a particularly informative opinion. Um, but over the years, this design thinking thing has caught on. And there are all sorts of corporations that are ready to throw over their traditional design practices in order to embrace the new wave of design thinking. I have been skeptical of design thinking for many years. For me, design thinking sounded very much like what I had been doing already for several years, not anything particularly new. But what I did see was an alarming uh, trend where um, design thinking became more design by committee. That by bringing in people who were not trained in design, oftentimes their opinions would outweigh those of the designers who were well versed in the skills of design. And that was something that um, I had a lot of problems for. You also hear a lot of um, people talking about no more design heroes anymore, that we don't need the designer as hero, that the designer is there to fulfill a role, not to be the superhero. Um, and uh, you know, you heard Stephanie uh, Wilson and Cornelius Rishira, Rishira, I'm sorry Cornelius, I butchered your name, um, talking about the changing roles in UX yesterday and how uh, product management and design have to get along. And, and that's very true, and a lot of that is coming through this new design thinking methodology. However, um, over the last several years, I had begun to realize that a lot of the uh, tools that I had relied on, uh, wireframing, uh, site mapping, um, uh, visual comps, were not working the way I thought they should. Instead, I was confusing customers more, so I had to retool my entire way of thinking. And so the uh, product managers who learn the old way of thinking oftentimes are very stuck in that design paradigm of static comps, static wireframes, and static design thinking. But we have new technologies. We heard yesterday from Shane Goodwin and David Montero about the coming of virtual reality and augmented reality. Now, as a longtime fan of cyberpunk and science fiction literature, VR and AR have always been coming for me. I did my, um, I did my undergraduate thesis in cyberpunk literature as postmodernism in 1992. Uh, and at the time, I thought I'd be, I would be jacking in any day now. And 20 years later, that really hasn't happened. However, I do believe that as we move towards these newer technologies, 
time becomes a um, compelling way to tell the stories and a necessity. And we're not going to be able to think about these static designs anymore. We're going to have to start thinking about temporal design. We're going to have to start thinking about our designs and how they behave in time, not just in space. So what are we going to be doing today? We're going to be talking about what is temporal design. Um, I'm going to talk about how we visualize design in time and give you some questions to answer. I have a, a, a five-layer stack of how I visualize time and design and the questions I ask myself when I'm doing that. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about how we can add temporal design thinking into the overall design thinking methodology that's widely accepted by many people today. To start off, though, we have to really understand what time is. Time is not this exact tick-tock that we oftentimes think it is. Time is relative. Time is relative to you and me and everybody around us. And I don't think that's anywhere better um, explained than in this quote. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten Houser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like <coughs> tears. We live in a very ephemeral world. We live in a world that is constantly changing, a world where nothing really lasts. But as designers, we oftentimes think that things last, that things persist. Um, I recently was uh, talking to Steve Krug. I was actually interviewing him for an article I was doing on how to perform a UI critique. And he said something in an email to me that I thought was just spot on. He said, we're thinking great literature, or at least product brochure, while the user's reality is much closer to a billboard going by at 60 miles an hour. We may spend hours, days, months staring at the same design, but it's going to be something that the user snaps by in an instant. Or as Ferris Bueller said, life moves pretty fast. If you don't slow down and look around, you might miss it. So I want to do a little experiment with you. I want you to look very closely at this photograph. Take it in. Look at everything in there, OK? Now I'm going to take it away, and I'm going to show it to you again. And there's going to be a change. And it's going to be a huge change, a big change. And I want to see if you see that change. So we take it away, and we bring it back. And hands up, no pointing, who sees the huge change? Got one person, a few people. A few people see the huge, huge. Y'all don't see it. It's complete. It's a completely different picture now. All right, I will, I will bring it back. I'll bring back the original. I'll bring back the original. All right, there's the original. Who sees the huge change? Who sees the huge change? A few more people. All right, keep looking. Go out, back in. Anybody? OK, a few more people. Out. Back in. All right, did you see it that time? Yeah. I took the entire engine out of that picture. <laughs> and most people didn't see it the first time. And a few people saw it more and more. Why? Because humans suffer something from something called change blindness. We are blind to change unless we see a transition from one state to the next. But so much of design, so much of user interface design expects people to remember from one instant to the next what they have just seen. Expects them not only in the short term, but in the long term. Uh, continuing on with Steve Krug, uh, he said, it's incredibly hard for UI designers to realize just how quickly people are zooming through or past the interface they've worked so hard to develop and how little of it they actually take in. And without those transitions, it's even harder. 
Interaction design is not about the instance. Interaction design is a long game. It's about the micro interactions in the instance, but then it's also about the macro interactions over time. So what is temporal design thinking? That's a really good question. I wish I had the answer. No, a joke, sorry, bad joke. Um, so as I once said very famously, all the world's a screen and the men and women merely play or one. I think, uh, I think Shakespeare said something similar, but uh, you know, he said a lot of things. So we all want to be the heroes of our own story or something called the prime mover. The prime mover is, in a way, it's another word for God. It's the name of the, per it's what you call the person at the center of the universe who is controlling all the action and moving everything around. And what they, we want to be, what the user wants to be, is that prime mover. But a, a user isn't really a prime mover. A user is someone who uses. That's why I try more and more to refer to actors, not users. I prefer to think of the people using my products as actors within an environment rather than users of a product. So, getting back to design thinking. It's thinking like a designer. Now, how many people in here consider themselves a designer? All right. All right, everybody hands down. How many people in here don't think of themselves as a designer? Okay, so there are a lot of people in here. How many of you who are not designers think you can think like a designer? Okay, a, a few people. So it's a little bit difficult to get past that. How do I go from being a non-designer to thinking like a designer? A lot of methodologies have been developed over the years to help people with that. According to Thomas Lockwood in his introduction to a uh, book of essays, Design Thinking, Integrating Innovation, cost, Customer Experience, and, and Brand Value, the value of design thinking is that by thinking like designers, being able to see details as well as zoom out to the big picture, we can really add value by challenging the status quo. And so what we're really after is not making you uh, into people who can see what color palette to choose or what font to use or what shape a button should be, but instead to help non-designers think in ways that are bigger than just um, a single product, seeing the big picture, being more holistic. There are three tenets uh, he gives to design thinking. These are the three main tenets of design thinking. The first is to develop a deep understanding of the, well, he says user, I replace it with actor, of the actor based on field work research. In other words, as we heard today, uh, or we heard yesterday about getting out there and meeting the people you are researching, going out and talking to them. Um, understanding them in their environment, not just treating them like subjects in a lab. Number two, collaborate with the actors through the formation of multidisciplinary teams. That is work together. Developers working with designers, working with product managers. And we're seeing that more and more in the agile methodology. Who in here has ever been uh, embedded with a team of other disciplines, product managers. Yeah, we're all seeing that. We're all moving in that direction. Number three, accelerate learning through visualization, hands-on experientialism, and creating quick prototypes which are made as simple as possible in order to get usable feedback. That's something I've been talking about for several years now. Uh, I, I have been a great proponent of interactive prototyping moving beyond static prototyping, moving beyond wireframing and, and visual comps, and moving to things that not only look, but act more like the final product. Um, one caveat there is oftentimes people confuse low fidelity with being fast and high fidelity with being slow. But as we heard earlier today, component libraries can go a long way to speeding up prototyping. By being able to take pre-made modules off and adapting them, 
you can quickly spin up prototypes that while they look high fidelity, might actually take a lot less time than trying to do something in a Photoshop document or in a sketch file. But for me, that wasn't quite enough. What I found the more I worked in design thinking and talking to people about design thinking is that the methodology they were using betrayed a very linear view of time. Cause, effect, cause, effect. But the way I experience uh, the world is not particularly linear. Talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but where I found inspiration was from Brenda Laurel's book, Computer as Theater, which if you haven't read, it was republished in the 2000s, but she wrote it before uh, the World Wide Web really became popular back in the early 90s. And she says, thinking about interface is, is thinking too small. Designing human computer experience isn't about building a better desktop. It's about creating imaginary worlds that have a special relationship to reality. Worlds in which we can extend, amplify, and enrich our own capacities to think and feel and act. Now to me, that's not a web page. That's not a web form. That's barely even an app sometimes. We think very small when we think about interfaces on the computer and not environments on the computer. So, how do we get past that? Well, design is very visual. Uh, one thing we know from psychologists is that we determine in the first tenth of a second what we think about something that we see. So within the first tenth of a second of looking at a website or an app, your brain has already started to make up its mind about what it feels. So that visceral, visual reaction is extremely important for determining how people trust. But then over time, people can lose trust in your product through interaction. If the interaction is bad, if the interaction is poor, if things break, if they can't find things and they can't move along, then they will lose trust. But then I add the temporal layer, which is the long game. Going beyond simple point-to-point -point interaction. And what is the overall value of the product over time, not just in the instance? So, for example, if I'm using a notepad product, I might initially be very enamored with its features and really enjoy using it. But over time, I might find that it doesn't really fulfill all the needs I have. For example, maybe it doesn't organize all my massive number of um, notes the way I need them to be organized for quick reference. So while at first, visually I might like it, interactively I might like it, over the long haul, I'm not going to enjoy that product. And this is where we run into a problem that uh, Jaron Lanier, who is the, the father of a lot of uh, computer interaction, uh, he wrote the wonderful book, You Are Not a Gadget. And in it, he talks about um, lock-in. Uh, the process of lock-in is like a wave gradually washing over the rule book of life, calling the ambiguities of flexible thoughts as more and more thought structures are solidified and effectively permanent reality. So what does that mean? It's a little bit philosophical, but it has a very real world uh, result. And that is when you choose a technology, when you choose a design pattern, when you choose all of these things that go into making your product, you are oftentimes locking yourself in to a future. So for example, back in the 2000s, when many corporations chose ASP.ASP um, to build their products on, they locked themselves into a future of poor technological innovation. If you choose Bootstrap today, if you choose Angular, or you choose React, or you choose Drupal over WordPress, you are locking yourself in to a certain development framework which will determine your future and how well you can innovate. So let's think about building a bridge. If I build a bridge, I'm wanting to uh, cross, say, cross a river, okay? 
But as soon as I start building that bridge, I am locking myself in. And if the width of the river changes, I have to rebuild the bridge or come up with some sort of emergency situation. If the course of the river changes, I oftentimes will have to, you know, if, if I'm sufficiently advanced enough, I might have to redirect a river so that it doesn't change. The place where people need to cross might change. I may build a bridge someplace and somebody builds a town down the road and no one wants my bridge anymore. And of course, finally, better methods of building bridges might come along with better materials. But I am already locked in to this bridge I have built. But really, the problem is that I decided to build a bridge in the first place. I locked myself into that solution. What was it I really wanted to do? Cross the river. Perfect. I wanted to get to the other side. I'm like the proverbial chicken. Okay? So, we assume that that is what I want to do, and so I have to build a bridge. However, a bridge is just one solution. I could dig a tunnel. I could build a jetpack. I could invent teleportation. There are all sorts of innovations that I have overlooked because I made an assumption about the solution that I was trying to get to, that I, that I wanted to do. So, getting back to design thinking. To add the temporal aspect to the tenets of design thinking, I add this fourth one. Follow the rhythm of the actors and how their needs and goals change both in context and over time to get to the optimal outcome. Because really what we're about is trying to get to the optimal outcome, not use a predefined set of solutions. So how do we visualize design in time? We have a hard time visualizing time. Time is not something that comes as naturally to us as space. Uh, first of all, we only really experiencing it going, what we say, forward. We don't go backwards in time or sideways in time. We only go forward. But we assume everybody has the same experience of time. But as Douglas Adams so brilliantly pointed out, time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. Time is not the same for each of us. So, I came up with this stack of how I begin to visualize design in time. And it starts by considering the context. The context of who I'm building it for, where they are, and maybe even when they are. So I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, next, narration. Telling a story. Stories are the best way to illustrate time. Agency. Allowing people, the actors, to have agency in their own decision making. Not forcing them down linear timelines or linear ways of doing things. Transitions. Because if I don't transition change, then people will run afoul of change blindness. And finally, adaptation. How is my product going to adapt to the changing needs of the user over time. So, get a picture of that. I'd say everybody, <laughs> give everybody a chance to get a picture of that. All right. Um, so, first, context. Set the stage for the user and understand what stage they are on. Um, to ask myself a few questions, I start with why questions, or where questions. Where are they? Where are they going? And where have they been? Are they using an iPhone in the middle of New York? Are they using an iPad on a farm in Iowa? Are they um, using a laptop in, um, in, um, in, in Wellington, shall we say? I, I was very American, uh, US centric there. I need to broaden my horizons. Next, narration. You want to build a story that unfolds. You want to build a story that they can see and feel and learn from. 
So I ask a lot of what questions when I'm thinking about narration. What is your voice? What is, what is the voice of the storyteller? Voice is extremely important in making sure that you are going to communicate clearly. Um, I have plenty of content strategists who I talk to on a daily basis who wring their hair because they have such a hard time getting their clients and customers to understand that if you use somebody else's voice, you're going to sound like them. What are their expectations? What are the expectations of the user from your story? And then finally, what is your story? Do you know your own story? Do you know your story from beginning to end? Next is agency. You want to make them the prime movers. You want to make them the heroes of their own story. And so for that, I ask a lot of how questions. I want to know how do they... Oh, sorry. Sorry. There we go. Uh, how questions. How do they think? You want to understand how your user thinks. Uh, see, I said it again, user. How does the actor think? Yeah, violating my own rules. How do they move? How do they move through the environment that you are creating for, um, for them? And then finally, how do they progress? How do they progress? Progress. That's how do they progress through your system? Next is transition. Show them the changes. Don't ever make changes in your interface without showing them. And this happens at the micro level and at the macro level. So you want to ask questions like, when does change need to happen? And when do I need to be still? When do I not need to change? When do I need to hold the interface still? Then finally, adaptation. And this is um, how you grow with your actors. And I ask why and will questions here. Why are they doing this now? Why is the user going to do this? And then will they need to do it every time? So for every interface decision I make, I ask myself those two uh, questions on both sides. Okay? Um, one case where this became especially important to me was I was uh, working at a bank and they wanted to come up with an app that would allow people to split the bill at the restaurant and um, so everybody paid what they owed. And I asked, uh, well, why are they going to do that? Why are they going to do that at that point? Well, people want to make sure they pay their fair amount. And I said, well, I, aren't you, are you sure? Aren't more people interested in having a good time? Isn't that the optimal outcome? Not making sure everybody pays the same amount? Now, for sure. I, let's see your hands up. How many people would rather worry about making sure everybody paid their fair share at a meal than having a good time? All right, one guy over here. I'm not going to dinner with you, that's for sure. Okay? Most people don't want to quibble over a few dollars at the risk of spending 15 minutes splitting up a bill. Okay? Part three, how do we add temporal design thinking to the design thinking process? Again, I get back to what is the purpose of user experience? Is it to create tasks to achieve a goal? Or is it to define a goal and then figure out what the tasks are? I go with, of course, the latter. UX is about the outcome, not the process you use to get there. I always start with, what is the optimal outcome for this project? Before I even think about whether I'm going to use CSS, HTML, C Sharp, um, whether it's going to be an iOS app, whether it's going to be an Android app, whether it's going to be on the web, whether I'm going to use you know, semaphore flags, it doesn't matter. What is it that we want to have happen? What is going to make people happy at the end of this project? Now, the current design thinking process goes something like this. You start with uh, empath empathy. You want to empathize with your actors. You go out and research. You learn about them. You do user testing. You do inventories. You may even do analysis of current products that are being used. You then define what you're wanting to do. That's where you get into the app outcome. What is the optimal outcome? You want to define that. Then you ideate. 
And ideate, that's a fancy word for coming up with ideas. Okay? So there you come up with ideas. That's where the sticky notes comes from. I think the UX industry has single-handedly kept uh, 3M in business. I think without the UX industry, they would have gone belly up a long time ago. Then you prototype. And I cannot stress enough how important prototyping is to getting ideas out of your head and in front of users to test. Again, I'm a fan of actual interactive prototyping, not static prototyping. And then, of course, you test. You test, you test, you test, and then you iterate, you iterate, you iterate. And that is, in a nutshell, the common uh, view of the design thinking process. But I, I wasn't exactly satisfied with this process. I felt something was missing. I, I felt we needed a better way of adding time, a sense of time, how things change over time. I felt this led to very static results every time I saw it used. And remember, a lot of people are very stuck in this linear view of time. We think in a line. We think about the happy path. You know, the happy path, that's the path, that's, that's the path that you're going to use to get to the Wizard of Oz. That's the path everybody is supposed to follow. Earlier today, though, somebody pointed out, yeah, that's not the path most people follow. And I would say that's the place where most bad user experience happens is outside of the happy path. Because usually those are the edge cases where people need the most help, where people are at their most vulnerable, and oftentimes are most let down by us. Because really, as any Doctor Who fan will know, time is a wibbly-wobbly thing. A wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey thing. And to think that we can go through one simple, straight, linear path to get to our destination is to really betray the complexity of how our users are interacting, our actors are interacting with our products. So, how do we get around that? Well, looking at this traditional um, design thinking process, I, I, I've thought about completely changing this. I thought about coming up with my own process and saying, okay, they're wrong, they're right. But there was so much good about this. There was so much that I thought, yeah, this is good. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna completely upset the apple cart, so I thought, what is it that would really add a sense of time to this? What is missing from this process that I felt would really do that? And that was simply to add storytelling. A component in here where you tell stories. Now, to be honest, a lot of design thinking already has storytelling built into it, but they don't really pull that out. They think of that as the empathy part. They think about that as maybe the definition part. But I think it deserves its own separate case, its own separate. Now notice though that I've linked it directly to the define. So there's a certain define iteration between telling stories and defining that is intrinsic to, to the process. I would also say you don't only want to iterate the entire process, you want to iterate in that first grouping. That's your deconstruction group. That is where you're deconstructing the problems. That is where you're trying to identify all of the edge cases, everything that's going on, and then prototyping and testing, ideate, prototype, test, is where you're synthesizing your solutions. So you deconstruct while you're ideating, in the first case, and then you synthesize. And those are two different iteration loops within a larger iteration loop. Okay? So, where do we go from here? How do we bring storytelling into our process? Um, well, as I, I told you the story of maps earlier, because I think maps are actually a very interesting way of doing this. However, it is one where I am still just experimenting with this. I've read some very promising research on actually methods to use a metro style, you know, London underground style mapping for mapping out processes rather than user flows, rather than, uh, you know, org chart style site maps, but actually building out a, a fully um, realized map where each line might represent a user type or a process, and each, uh, each uh, station represents a node or some sort of um, activity within the product. I haven't done enough research on that to really talk about it uh, any further than that, but hopefully that might be a talk for a later time. What I do know about for telling stories is storyboards. 
Storyboards are a time-tested uh, technique for telling stories in the, uh, in the cinema industry um, where you break down a story into sequential scenes. It's also something that uh, if you're a comic book fan, you're very familiar with as well. Because basically, I, I remember hearing um, when they were talking about making a, a movie from a comic book, I, I forget which one it was, but the, the director said, this is perfect because I already have all my storyboards boards printed and bound in this book. So that's my, that's my movie right there, right? How many people in here have done storyboards like this? Okay. All right, good. So a good number of you. Um, I, I highly recommend storyboarding out. Now, there's something I call the fidelity cliff when it comes to prototyping. And the fidelity cliff is when you start spending more time on things like prototypes and storyboards than you do on actually improving the product. So you've got to be careful with that balance, but storyboards are a great way to do it. Of course, experience mapping has become quite the thing recently, uh, led uh, to a large extent by Adaptive Path. I have uh, this wonderful book on uh, Adaptive Path's Guide to Experience Mapping. It also includes things like journey mapping, where you're looking at the emotional reaction of people over time uh, during the use of the product where you look at interactions with the back system so that you're not ignoring the technological components of what's going into the product experience. So I highly recommend that as well. What I have been playing with a lot recently is video. Uh, using video to tell a product story. Now, this actually combines a bit of marketing with a bit of storytelling and a bit of UX and UI. And I do this in order to be able to present the big idea to as large a group as possible. Um, how I did this recently was, um, so I'm not, if I go up here. And, ah, good. So how I did this recently was for a uh, client of mine called Room Refs. Now Room Refs um, saw a need in the, uh, in the, in the tourism industry where Airbnb, Booking.com, uh, travel, uh, travel Advisor, and other short-term rental properties were having difficulties because there was no independent verification. There was no independent review of these different rooms. There were just too many rooms. So they're setting up a system whereby they hire, they hire reviewers to go into these properties and they have a very set um, system for reviewing this. But why am I telling you this? I should just show you my story. Room Refs is an exciting new concept for rating accommodations from short-term rental companies like Airbnb and TripAdvisor. You're traveling to a new city and need a place to stay. Short-term rentals like Airbnb and TripAdvisor are great alternatives to hotels, but how do you really know what you're getting? When they say luxury apartment, do they mean the Ritz-Carlton or Marriott Courtyard? Does in the heart of the city really mean extremely noisy? Does cozy garden apartment really mean a window ledge with a potted plant? Does public transportation nearby really mean it's a one-mile walk to the closest bus stop? You need honest and accurate information, not marketing. Room Refs provides consistent and unbiased reports that will make your decisions easier. Here's how it works. After you find a place to rent on your favorite short-term rental service, you ask for a Room Refs report from the host. If they already have a report, they send you the link. If not, then they contact the Room Refs and set up an appointment at a convenient time. A room ref is dispatched and performs a detailed evaluation of the property, confirming what the host has reported, adding professional photos, and commenting on any pros and cons they find. They then submit the report, which takes about 10 minutes using the room ref's mobile app. You can then view a basic report for free or, for $1, view the entire room ref's report. Now you can book your stay on the rental service of your choice, safe in the knowledge that what you see is what you get. Room Refs, the travel referees. For more details, visit us at roomrefs.com. All right, so 
Um, so I want to leave you today uh, with a final quote, with a final little inspirational quote. Um, music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. Come along, come along. So, what I want to leave you with is that your dreams are the maps of the future. And what you dream up now is going to inform what people are doing in a year, five years, ten years, a hundred years. So, good luck with that, and thank you all very much for coming.